The punishing difficulty of From Software Masterpiece Dark Souls 3. The space opera adventures of Commander Shepard in Mass Effect. What a fun bunch. I think I'll take my next leave here. The strange single player MMO hybrid stylings of Final Fantasy 12. What do all of these titles have in common? For me, these are just a handful of my comfort games. A comfort game is one that you can come back to, and no matter how you're feeling, no matter what else may be going on in your life, you will feel comfortable for returning to that game. It's like changing into your favourite shirt when you get home from work. You know the one I mean, the one that's at least a size too big. Or when you order food from your favourite takeaway, because you know it's going to taste good, and you no longer have to worry about cooking or the cleanup afterwards. Somewhere in all of our fight or flight development, ingrained into our DNA over millions of years, is the ability to recognise something familiar, to appreciate when something feels safe. Whether it's your favourite item of comfortable clothing, a book that you love to reread, or your favourite meal, you know what it is and you know what it means, and your brain floods your body with relaxed feelings as a reward. Unless you're brand new to my channel, you likely know that I'm on a mission to deal with my backlog. I managed to find a way to do this that doesn't have a negative impact on my mental health, and it's going really well so far. Still, in spite of all this, my backlog is still a project, and it's one that I have made a commitment to complete and then turn into videos. Even with all of my mental safeguards in place, it is still a working project of sorts, and we all need to take breaks from work sometimes. I recently went to visit my family for a few days, which was in absolutely no way the kind of break I had in mind, but my visits do involve a massive chunk of travelling, so I packed my trusty Switch. Even with the stack of unplayed Mario games that I am genuinely excited to get to, I perused my catalogue of installed games and settled instead on Final Fantasy XII The Zodiac Age. I'm not sure what made me choose it that day, but I do know that I quickly lost all notion of the train around me, and it seemed like only five minutes later that it was time to switch trains and top up on Starbucks, even though in reality it had been over an hour. I could take or leave the original Final Fantasy XII, but the Zodiac Age is a rare example of a Final Fantasy game that I have the Platinum for, and as this story would also suggest, paid for more than once. The Zodiac Age introduced a whole host of new features that reduced blow and gave more weight to how you set up your party. It also brought in the super useful trial mode, which allowed you to transfer everything you earned across to your main adventure, and this effectively removed any need to grind for levels or money. Tie all of this together with the already amazing Gambit system, and being able to run the game at 2 or 4 times speed, and the result was a faster and far more streamlined and satisfying experience. By far the greatest bonus as far as I'm concerned, is how all of this results in a game that doesn't require the same level of control or dexterity, making it very comfortable to play on the Switch in its handheld form, which isn't something that I do very often. Final Fantasy XII is a unique example of a comfort game not just for the reasons already discussed, but because until a few weeks ago, I did not even know that I could class it as a comfort game, but when I stopped to think about why it relaxed me so much, everything started to fall into place. As of my last backlog video, I have covered 17 backlog games on this channel so far, and according to my backlog tracker, I have cleared and captured footage for even more than that. In fact, I already have all the required footage and a completed script for my next video, which is going to cover the Assassin's Creed Ezio collection, ready to go whenever I am. But when I was forced away from my PS5, onto public transport, still with access to my Switch but away from recording equipment, I was forced to take a break from my backlog project. A break I didn't even know that I needed, because I had been enjoying the project. But all the same, it was a break that my brain rewarded me for, with all of the happy and relaxing feels. It makes you wonder though, what type of comfort games resonate with different people, and why those particular games? I know a lot of people find multiplayer games very comforting. Smack your mother with a mayonnaise jar, mother. Keep on like a five dollar foot long, mother. You get at the corner store. Man, you look like a $10 dick long. Are you $10? Sorry, couldn't resist the obvious joke. In a series like Call of Duty, you have a core loop with ingrained metagames and regular progress rewards. It's a steady flow of dopamine hits and predictability, designed to keep you playing, so of course, many people will find this familiar and therefore comforting. However, when it comes to story-based single-player games, I really do wonder why different games work for different people. 
Could it be because of a connection they forged with that game during a particular time in their life? This is entirely possible. I first connected with Mass Effect, my favourite game of all time, during a period in my life where I was unemployed, and it helped me find solace between interviews and firing off my CV wherever I could. Quick note for Americans, a CV is a resume. On the flip side of things, I have never completed Dragon Age Origins or Fallout New Vegas, because I was living in a shared house when I started them, and unfortunately I will forever associate both games with times I had to quickly down controller and go help with bad things happening in a different room, and when I came back I had lost my appetite for the game. The point is, emotional connections with games, exactly like with songs or films or books, is entirely possible. But what about the games themselves? I also remember trying Velvet Assassin when I was unemployed, but the only reason I remember that game is because it was the absolute worst pile of crap I had ever played up till that point in my life. I can only assume Fight or Flight once again plays a part here, like when you remember that you shouldn't touch the sharp thing, or volunteer for the development opportunity. So even though I don't have an emotional connection to Velvet Assassin, I remember it because it was bad. Following that logic, for a game to forge this level of connection with us, is it enough for a game to just be good? No. No it is not. My very first line in this script referenced Dark Souls 3. Why not Bloodborne? What about Elden Ring? Both games are excellent, I've platinum both of them, and sunk hundreds of hours in, so what makes them different to me from Dark Souls 3? Bloodborne is simple enough to answer, I just don't know it well enough. Elden Ring was a little trickier, because I know it extremely well, and at times I do find it extremely comforting. The problem with Elden Ring is nothing has ever recreated the feeling attached to that first playthrough. Everything was a discovery, amplified hard by Elden Ring being my first From Software game. I didn't have anything to worry about or keep track of. I just moved forward and tried not to die. In every subsequent playthrough, I've known what is and isn't worth doing, and it forms a list in my head of things to do and things to keep track of. It can still be tons of fun if I'm in the mood, but it has never been the same. Dark Souls 3, on the other hand, is a far more linear adventure. I don't really have anything to keep track of beyond the odd obscure quest, like the bit with Patches or Onion Bro. It's just me and the gameplay, in my personal favourite of the Souls trilogy, with no areas that I dread redoing or bosses that I dread refighting, besides the King of course. Once again, we are back at the comfortable, back at the familiar. Dark Souls 3 is a game where I largely know what's going to happen and there isn't much I need to think about beyond what's happening in the moment. We can apply this same logic to the Resident Evil remakes. I find 1, 3 and 4 far more comforting to play than 2, even though 2 is incredible and I know it just as well as the others, because 2 has Mr. X. For significant chunks of all four campaigns, Mr. X can and often will pop up wherever he damn well likes. The dude is a literal unknowable unknown. This was scary at first, annoying thereafter, but it's still something extra my brain has to contend with. It's not something I can know ahead of time, unless I pick Claire and progress to the sewers. The first remake has Lisa Trevor and 3 of course has Nemesis, but they're both largely absent, and even when they can be spontaneous, it's largely scripted. So, now that we know it's not enough for a game to just be good, let's talk about the game that I love more than any other game that I have played in my entire life. The first Mass Effect was something of a flawed masterpiece. For over 10 years, my favourite game featured easily the least refined version of combat in the series, hilariously bad texture popping, and one or two game-breaking bugs. The Legendary Edition thankfully made enormous improvements to the first game and smoothed out all of these issues, but as any long-time fan of the series will tell you, the technical issues were such a small price to pay to experience this wonderful, wonderful game. Mass Effect boasted one of the best realised universes I have ever seen, and it was delivered with so much care and passion, resulting in some of the most beloved fictional characters ever written. Yes, there is an overarching, galaxy-threatening plot at the centre of the trilogy driving everything forward, but in the first Mass Effect in particular, it really is all about the journey and those you take it with. 
You see, you don't know the true nature of the threat until the third act, and until then you're always a step behind, trying to figure out the mystery, all the while visiting everything from spectacular space stations to uncharted planets with cows that will rob you if you point the camera away from them. Once again, there are some key takeaways. Familiarity and an emotional connection. When I step onto the virtual bridge of the Norman DSR-1 and the music kicks in, I feel like I'm home and the crew feel like family. Garrus as he slowly learns that rules are there for a reason. Tally who can't wait to grow up but soon feels homesick and uh, others. As much as you love your dog, it isn't human. Done. So, all of this begs the question, how do games become comfort games? Only you can know what your comfort games are because it's a feeling that you feel. A month ago, I could and would have told you that Mass Effect was one of my comfort games, but I genuinely did not know the Zodiac Age was one. A good starting place, I'd say, is to look at games that you like to replay. Are there also games that you like to replay despite their age? Do they fail the test of time but still hold up in your book? What about if they were remastered to overcome their shortcomings? Whether it's the gameplay, the music, the characters, the world, or any other number of things, something in these games resonates with us so hard that it puts our brains at peace. Jobs, school, relationships, they all fade away to the back of our minds, and in their place is silence. It's just you and the game existing in the moment, and everybody deserves to know this feeling, regardless of where it comes from. What are some of your comfort games, and what makes them so special to you? I'm always fascinated to hear what resonates with other people. One person told me their comfort game was Alien Isolation, which as far as I'm concerned is really f***ing worrying, but all the same, it was interesting to learn how far afield this type of discussion can go. I have really appreciated this break from my usual backlog content, but please rest assured it will be back with you soon, and we'll be checking in on everybody's favourite Italian player by Come Assassin, Ezio Auditore. Thank you very much for watching, my friends. See you on the next one.